whether antifibrotics impact uh, on mortality across interstitial lung disease, including IPF, or let's say not only in IPF. So please uh, vote, and then we can see which is the state of the art. So, I think we have some seconds, and then after that, we can see the results. Okay. Oh, very interesting. So, for the majority of the audience, FEC decline is predictive of further decline in the future, and antifibrotics impact. Uh, yeah, the destiny of ILD and not only in IPF. Okay, we will see what the literature, available literature and uh, evidence tell us. So I have chosen these uh, topics, current concepts in ILD management. The concept of progressive pulmonary fibrosis and the impact on ILD management and the future direction. So what expect us? Uh, there are several uh, factors uh, reflecting progression in ILD. Uh, there are subjective factors like uh, symptoms, quality of life of our patients. There are medical factors like uh, complication of ILD, like acute exacerbation. And there are objective uh, factors like pulmonary function tests and uh, imaging. And what we use in our clinical practice to assess and manage ILD is mostly based on pulmonary function tests. So we have the decline in FEC and or the DLCO. The definition of progression in ILD originates from IPF. This was the German guideline 2013 when we wrote that progression is generally associated with a decline in FEC of uh, or between 150 and 200 ml per year on average without antifibrotic treatment in IPF. But the real problem is that there is no standard definition of progression even in IPF. Uh, and the evolution of symptoms and radiologic findings should be considered in addition to pulmonary function tests even in IPF. And based on the available literature at that time, a decline in FEC greater than 10% predicted within six months is associated with high mortality risk. But is the FEC decline homogeneous across ILD? And the answer is no, it's quite homogeneous across, uh, for example, the trials in IPF. You can see here all the trials, um, all the, so the, the FEC decline in all the trials, placebo arm, in IPF, and then you see this decline uh, over to uh, four uh, years. Um, and then you see the census trial over uh, the other. So this is the trial for systemic sclerosis where the decline was less pronounced than in IPF in the placebo arm. And the OMERACT consensus group, this was a, a mixed group between uh, rheumatologists and pneumologists they have um, tried to define the progression or the decline in FEC and DLCO uh, across uh, um, ILDs associated with connected tissue disease. And this was the result of the consensus. You see the clinical meaningful progression for ILD in CDD was proposed as uh, the greater or equal decline in FEC than 10% or between Five and 10% associated with a, decline, a relative decline in DSCO uh, greater than or equal than 15%. But if you carefully look at the progression rate in the census or in, in the scleroderma trials, in the scleroderma lung study, one trial was 13% in the placebo arm, and the census trial was 80.3% in the placebo arm within one year. So uh, if we compare with IPF, it's another planet, right? And now to answer the first pulling question, is FEC decline predictive of further decline or predictive of progression? The answer is a clear no. And also in IPF, uh, where the progression is constant, you can see that the patients having a progression or having stabilization in the first year, 
uh, could be remain stable in the second period or have a decline, um, but it was not predictable from the uh, FEC baseline values or even the uh, changes in FEC in the first six months. The concept of uh, pulmonary uh, progressive pulmonary fibrosis has been, uh, uh, let's say, investigated since uh, at least 10 years. And uh, in, in 2022, we had the first consensus definition uh, from the task force of ATS, ERS, GRS, and ALAT, uh, which uh, wrote a very useful clinical practical uh, guidelines. So the concept of progressive pulmonary fibrosis is based on three criteria. So worsening of respiratory symptoms, physiological evidence of disease progression with an absolute decline in FEC, greater than 5% within one year, or absolute decline in DLCO, uh, greater than 10% within one year, and radiological evidence of disease progression based on five criteria. So generally the increased extent and severity of traction bronchiectasis or bronchiectasis, new ground glass opacification, fine reticulation, and new or increased honey camping. But uh, be careful, we need uh, at least two criteria of three. And this is a definition of a phenotype useful to drive management and treatment decision in ILD, but it's not a novel ILD classification. What happened in the past? Why the consensus task force uh, decided to adopt this definition of PPF? So this was the very heterogeneous situation in the past. The most common definition of progression was the PF ILD, so progressive fibrosing ILD, uh, which was very similar but there are some differences which I uh, summarized in this table. So uh, the most important one is the progression time frame, which was two years for the PFILD definition and one year for the PPF definition. The decline in FEC uh, was a relative decline in the PFILD definition. This is an absolute decline in the PPF definition. The symptoms are present in both definitions and the HRC, HRCT findings were not specified in PFILD definition, and now the five categories are very clear in the new definition. So this is the yeah, figure representing the ILD manifesting PPF. This will be discussed further in the uh, other talks. But what I, I want to stress is that 25 to 30 percent of all non-IPF ILDs can develop a PPF phenotype. So. It's uh, quite common across all these uh, ILD entities. And what about acute exacerbation? Why were they excluded from the definition? Because for, uh, after acute exacerbation, you don't have always uh, progression. So the patients can remain stable also over one year, for example, because we know now from the literature that acute exacerbation are mostly triggered by infections. And if, if you stabilize the patient, if you don't change antifibrotic treatment, you can really reach a stabilization also over one year. So in practice, clinicians should reassess the patients after acute exacerbation and use this assessment to determine if progression occurred. And this is what we know from the biggest study on progressive patients in ILD from France, the PROGRESS uh, study, uh, that may gender age uh, greater or equal to 50 years and underlying ILDs are the most important predictors of mortality in ILD. So if you see the, of course, um, uh, the, the disease more related to progressive or the unclassifiable ILD and the exposure related ILD. The goals in the ILD management are uh, to stop disease progression, prolong survival, prevent acute exacerbations, and reduce symptoms. A lot of uh, treatment strategies are available. The medical treatment is the center of the management in ILD, but is I would I would say fifty to seventy percent. All the other issues like uh, vaccinations, prevention of infection, nutrition, uh, long-term oxygen therapy, motivation, and uh, also physiotherapy or rehabilitation are uh, really uh, important to stabilize the patient and to avoid uh, progression. 
And what we have learned from IPF is this also comorbidities should be uh, assessed at the beginning and over time. So we know the most common complications of IPF and ILD are pulmonary hypertension, gastroesophageal reflux, obstructive sleep apnea, and lung cancer. And it should be carefully assessed every year in our patients. And then, of course, how to monitor uh, uh, ILD over time. So we uh, we don't have a consensus on, on HRCT, but uh, we all perform an HRCT every 12 to 15 months in our patients, especially if we see changes in uh, chest X-ray or pulmonary function tests. And then a uh, further question is how to manage properly acute exacerbation and how to manage respiratory failure over time. Uh, the medical treatment I mentioned is the center of ILD management. For IPF, we had an update in 2022 about the treatments. So compared to the guideline 2018, we had only the update of a negative recommendation for anti-acid therapy or anti-reflux uh, surgery based on the new evidence available, the positive recommendation for nitalinine and pyrfenidone, and the negative recommendation, a strong one, for anticoagulation, imatinib, the triple, th triple therapy, and ambrisentan remained unchanged. And now, how to treat pulmonary, progressive pulmonary fibrosis? In an international guideline, we uh, don't have any recommendation for prefenidone based on insufficient evidence. And for nintedanib, we had a positive conditional recommendation in patients who have failed the start and management for fibrotic ILD. Uh, and and we, uh, this is a recommendation with a low quality of evidence. But now there is a discussion what does standard management mean? So. Of course, this can be intended as immunosuppressive treatment in CTD ILD, for example, or HP in attempt to stabilize or reverse interstitial initial uh, disease, antigen remediation or antigen avoidance in uh, hypersensitivity immunomonitis, or even observation. And standard management can vary, of course, from region to region. In the German guidelines, we have tried to address this question or this uh, uncertainty area uh, more uh, strictly, but it was very difficult. We had a huge discussion with rheumatologists because also the standard treatment for ILD associated with CTD is not um, homogeneous uh, at national and international level, I would say. So the recommendation for the antifibrotic treatment was based on mortality, disease progression, respiratory symptoms, and acute exacerbation. These were the outcomes considered by the uh, task force group for in this um, recommendation. And uh, the total number of patients were, was uh, 663 and based on the inbuilt trial population. Um, the same year, uh, we have published a meta-analysis of effect of nintedanib in reducing FTC decline across uh, interstitial lung diseases, considered, considering more than 1,300 patients and the same with uh, the trials with the same primary endpoint, that is uh, the rate of decline in FTC over 52 weeks. And this were the trial we uh, included in process one and two in IPF, census trial I've already mentioned and the in in PPF. And, and is, as you can see, the global effect of nitadenib on the rate of decline was very consistent across the trial and also in the in trial across the subpopulations based on the HRCT patterns. So that is UIP-like and non-UIP-like. All uh, the data go in favor for of nitadenib in reducing the decline or even disease progression as we want to define. And um, now we have also the data, complete data sets from the inbuilt trial, also the part B. So after the 52 weeks of the primary endpoint, and as we can see, uh, what we observe in the part A of the trial uh, has been confirmed in the overall population and also in, in those patients with each UIP pattern on HRCT in the second year of uh, treatment and also the signal in, in the reduction of risk of acute exacerbation or death 
uh, in the overall population by 33% in uh, the entire duration of the in -built trial. And now we have also some data not yet published on the inbuilt from the inbuilt on trial. So this was the rollover rollover trial after completion uh, of inbuilt trials. So all the patients. Uh, received an intedanib uh, at the end of the inbuilt trial or continued intedanib from the inbuilt trial. And as you can see, again, we have uh, also in the second year of uh, treatment or even longer, uh, we had the same um, uh, trend in reducing FEC uh, over time. What about perfenin? Why perfenin not even receive any positive recommendation uh, in the guidelines? So uh, we have only one trial in progressing uh, fibrosing ILD. And this is the re relief trial, the German one, uh, double-blind randomized placebo control phase 2B trial, investigator-driven. And this is the very heterogeneous population of ILD patients, including uh, idiopathic fibrotic NSIP and uh, asbest related asbest lung fibrosis, 5% uh, of patients. The uh, most consistent population was chronic HP, 45% of patients. And one uh, of the difference with the inbuilt trial was the um, <clears throat> permission of immune modulatory treatment so that 81% uh, of our patients uh, continued the uh, uh, immune modulation uh, over uh, time. The primary endpoint was the change from baseline to week uh, 48 of uh, percent uh, predicted FVC. And as you can see through the sensitivity analysis we have performed, uh, the, the trial was a bit problematic because we had to stop the trial due to slow recruitment and uh, some uh, one fertility analysis, which was negative. So we had to perform a lot of sensitivity and or confirmatory analysis, but they were positive in favor of pifenidon in this trial, but we have recruited only 127 patients. So are this trial, the inbuilt and the relief uh, comparable? The answer is no, because the difference duration, the different duration of the trial, uh, the different patient population, the different um, Yes, co-medications which were allowed uh, in, in uh, the trial. So I would say an head to head comparison is not uh, proper, appropriate. But the German guidelines published a couple of weeks ago gave a positive recommendation for pifenidone with a consensus uh, of 100% in the task force group, probably because the trial <laughs> comes from Germany. But we uh, considered the sensitivity analysis, even the number of patients was low sufficient to give a positive recommendation. The real world evidence tells us that uh, the impact of antifibrotics uh, on mortality is consistent. This is, uh, these are data from the Korean study and from the European registry. And we see a, a mortality risk reduction up to 40% over time and less uh, respiratory and non-respiratory related hospitalization. And the, the data from the inside IPF registries for Germany confirm this trend. And also uh, several meta-analyses on uh, uh, retrospective cohorts and uh, observational study with high or low bias risk. You see the diamond here, the overall size effect is in favor of antifibrotics uh, in terms of mortality in IPF and also in terms of uh, acute exacerbation risk uh, in this uh, progressive uh, disease. And this is an interesting analysis from Denmark. You can see the, that the impact of antifibrotics depend on treatment initiation time in IPF. So the earlier, the better. And in terms of transplant free survival and the uh, combined endpoint transplant free survival and progression, you see that uh, also in advanced IPF, you can see an advantage. But uh, the earlier you start with the treatment, the better will be the outcome for the patients. Future direction in ILD management. We have a lot of uh, not answered questions. Again, about FEC uh, as the best or more precise biomarker for progression. Uh, my answer personally is no. Uh, do acute exacerbation always lead to BPF? In my opinion, the answer is no. 
can underlying ILD specify influence the long term um, specificity influence the long term efficacy of antifibrotics or drug combinations the future of IPF or PPF treatment and uh, whether disease-specific treatment protocols are possible or will be uh, always or will remain a case-by-case -case decision in these complex patients. We have now new uh, insights from imaging biomarkers based on uh, um, machine learning or artificial intelligence methods. We have several methods. We know the most uh, most. Uh, famous is the Caliper uh, one um, developed for uh, COPD, but further validation is needed because all these uh, deep learning uh, based softwares have to learn from a good patient's population source. They are also uh, not unbiased, let's say. And this is a practical application of the Caliper system to quantify progression. You see the normal line in green and the fibrotic line in yellow, how the progression is impressive in the, these patients over three years, for example. And we have also circulating biomarkers we are, which are promising to uh, catch progression in an early phase in our patients. But as you can clearly see, they are not disease specific and that's quite a problem, of course. So we are uh, really waiting for the results of the first biomarkers trials in patients with uh, progressing um, ILD, so the injustice trial. I saw the um, results of the demographic, so the presentation of demographics of the patients including this trial at the last uh, ERS conference. So we are uh, waiting now for the uh, results in terms of uh, validation of one or multiple biomarkers to catch progression. There are also positive uh, promising signals from genetics. Uh, for example, the telomere length association or even mutations in telomerase uh, can be associated with ILD progression across several ILDs, uh, in this case, IPF, IPAF, and CTG ILD, as you can see. So sure that telomeres are associated with more progression. And then we have the clinical trials in uh, PPF. So uh, mostly are phase two, but there is also a trial uh, by Beringer Ingelheim on pda b inhibitor, the fibronin trial, which is very promising based on the results of the phase two trial in IPF. And in the future, we really have to face the problem of uh, combining anti-fibrotics and anti-inflammatory uh, medications, uh, not only which combinations are possible, but when to start anti-fibrotics and when to stop uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. So this will be one of the challenging issues of the task forces in the future and also uh, we have to face the situation of uh, new first-in-class antifibrotics and new uh, immune modulatory treatments, which are complex, but I think in the future we will have an advantage. So we can uh, combine these treatments in the clinical trials because we won't be allowed to perform a true placebo uh, arm clinical trial in the future. So we can collect data on the combination or sequential treatment directly from the new clinical trials. So uh, available then for uh, evidence. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed my presentation and then we can discuss later some uh, new uh, further questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Professor Francesco. Now we'll go on over to Professor Nicole. Professor Nicole, can you share your slides, please? Can everyone see my slides? Yep, good to go. Great, excellent. Um, well, thank you to CS and, B and Borenga for the invitation to speak, and thank you to Francesco for setting the scene. Uh, so you've heard from Francesco of why treatment is important and why it is to, to maintain treatment. Um, but my task today is to say why it's early to, well, why is it worthwhile to start treatment early? Uh, just on my disclosures. Um, so I've got two questions as well that needs to be polled. Um, the first question is, uh, success being uh, equal, when do you start antifibrotic treatments in patients with IPF? Uh, one, at the time of diagnosis. Two, only if there's uh, evidence of, uh, uh, sorry, two is uh, if there is moderate to severe disease. 
Uh, three, if there's evidence of progression, or four, never, I don't believe in any fibrotic therapy. So that's the first question. And the second question is, uh, when do you start antifibrotic therapy in patients with progressive pulmonary fibrosis? Uh, what, so A is worsening symptoms alone, B is worsening disease on CT, C is declining lung function, uh, E is, sorry, I can't seem to move my slides. Uh, e is a combination of, sorry. Is, uh, four is a combination of uh, worsening symptoms and uh, CT change. Um, five is uh, uh, a combination of worsening symptoms and declining lung function. Six is a combination of CT change and lung function. And seven is all the above or eight, which I don't have there is I'm totally confused. Great. So the first question is at the time of diagnosis, um, there are people that still believe you start only if there's um, significant disease or disease progression. Uh, and the second question was uh, majority actually said all three. Okay, great. Right. So I don't, yeah, okay. So, so I'm going to spend, uh, so I'm going to talk about is early treatment in IPF in particular really worthwhile? Uh, and the answer is a resounding yes, without a doubt. Uh, and I'm going to try to persuade you or convince you in the next, in the next half an hour why that, that should be the case. So I've got a case uh, study to start off with. Uh, Mr. Didi, he's 78 years old, he's a retired carpenter. Uh, and he's got 18 months of worsening cough, predominantly dry with some scant white sputum, and 12 months of worsening breathlessness on exertion. He's on a background of presumed COPD. He's never had lung function to uh, confirm that, but he's on triple therapy. So it's on inhaled corticosteroids, long-acting muscarinic antagonist, and long-acting uh, long beta agonist. He's a, he's an ex-smoker. Uh, he has a history of cough and recurrent chest infections. He's got a background history of hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, osteoarthritis, um, reflux, and he's on a number of medications, including uh, Trilogy for his uh, COPD. Um, he sees a new GP who actually listened to this chest, and he found some uh, chest crackles on auscultation and orders a HRCT. And uh, this is a HRCT of his chest. Um, again, there were about over 200 slices, but I've, I've taken a few slices out of that, that pile. So we're going to go through it really quickly. Um, so, initial, so we've got, um, as you can see, the right and the left lung here. Uh, as we scroll down, you can start to see these uh, subpleural peripheral reticulation and maybe a hint of a honeycomb there. And as you go down, really not much disease to speak about, but there is a there is increasing reticulation as we're going down to the bases. Um, again, very mild disease, and then at the bottom we have these um, honeycomb changes. Uh, really uh, obvious, obviously at the basis. So we've got a, we've got a, uh, we've got changes with uh, subpleural, uh, uh, bi-basal, uh, peripheral reticulation with an apical gradial uh, basal gradient. So it's 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 more obvious at the basis, uh, and there's definitely honeycombing at the basis. So this would fit, fit with a usual interstitial pneumonia pattern or a UIP pattern. Right. Going back to the case, um, so he's a he was a carpenter and had some wood dust exposure, but no clear asbestos exposure. Otherwise, there were no other relevant risk factors, including uh, lack of any autoimmune diseases. On examination, he was not clubbed, but he had indeed fine crackles on chest and auscultation. Uh, we had he had a blood screen and, and a negative autoimmune blood screen. He had a lung function test. Um, which is on the right hand side, so he had spirometry, gas transfer and lung volumes. On spirometry, he had well-preserved lung uh, ventilatory function. Uh, he had a normal FVC of 93% of predicted and a normal ratio, so not obstructed as well. Uh, so normal ventilatory function had a mildly reduced gas transfer of 68% after correction for hemoglobin. No lung volumes, there was no evidence uh, of hyperinflation and had a normal TLC. So really relatively well-preserved lung function with mild reductions in gas transfer. 
So in summary, this is a gentleman in his, in his late 70s uh, who was a carpenter. And apart from wood dust, has no other risk factors for an ILD. Um, he has crackles on chest osculation uh, and a negative autoimmune screen. And on, on lung function, he has well-preserved ventilatory function, but mild reduction in gas transfer. So this is a case of uh, IPF or early IPF with well-preserved uh, spirometry and well mild reduction in gas transfer. Right, so why is early antibiotic fibrate therapy really worthwhile in IPF? And really pertains to two factors, the disease itself and antifibrotic therapy itself. I'm gonna then talk about these two separately. So we know that IPF is, is, is a chronic progressive fibrotic lung disease associated with irreversible loss of lung function. And even with treatment, that once you've lost the lung function, you can't gain it back. So it's irreversible loss of lung function. And that's probably the single most important reason why we should treat early, because once we, we lose lung function, we can never get it. It has a, a poor prognosis and a disease cause is highly variable and unpredictable. And so if every time a patient says to me, well, when should I start treatment? Can you tell me when I'm going to progress? If I had that question answered every time I have an answer, I would be very rich by now. But unfortunately, I don't have the answer. So we know that prognosis, uh, prognosis is poor. So this is a um, survival curve uh, of, um, of various cancers and IPF is at the end. You can see that, that the prognosis is uh, compared pretty much you know, poor and worse than most cancers apart from lung and, and pancreas. So IPF is associated with a poor prognosis, a bit like a malignancy as well. And then we know that disease causes highly, highly variable and unpredictable. Whilst we have biomarkers that, that, that potentially can predict progression, this is still not uh, available for clinical practice. Um, so you can see we talk about um, variability. So we know people can crash and burn very rapidly on diagnosis. Over time, they can slowly progress, uh, such as line C and D, and not, not uncommonly they have what we call step-like progression. So they tend to progress, they tend to be stable and then progress, and then stable and progress, a bit like a step, okay? And they can have any of those combinations of, of disease behavior as well. They also can have kid exacerbations, which you've heard Francesca talk about. So these are uh, out of the blue worsening of lung function uh, or, and, and, or symptoms and worsening disease. Uh, and usually within a month, uh, uh, within a month period, uh, and, and the journey associated with a poor outcome uh, and a high, high mortality and really very, very little treatment that's effective. Okay, so we've talked about those factors. Um, Again, patients with mild disease progress at the same rate as patients with more severe disease. Okay, so this is looking at the Australian IPF registry data. Uh, so the dotted line are patients with more than 80% predicted at baseline compared to patients with less than 80% FEC. Did we lose Professor Nicole? Yeah, I think uh, there's some issues with her internet. So probably let's wait for a while and for, for her to get back. Okay, sure. So while waiting for her, is Professor Francesco online? Prof. I think there's an internet delay. So, Prof, while waiting for um, yes. Professor Nicole, probably I can um, urge the. Um, sorry. Yeah, while waiting for Professor Nicole to come back. And um, so that the audience, I have some, I urge the audience to probably put in some questions. I have one question for you, Prof. Um, Francisco. Um, we, as what Professor Nicole was talking about, biomarkers, pertaining to the progression of um, the uh, prognosis and biomark, progression and prognosis with biomarkers, how close, you should share a few, how 
close are we in a validated biomarkers that we can use in clinical practice? That's a challenging question. So we have a lot of uh, promising data also from uh, biomarkers um, analysis from the clinical trials. We will present some results from the EBIT trial um, um, biomarkers pool uh, at the ATS this year. But uh, I think there are some promising markers like KL6 uh, MMPs, which can uh, be uh, considered the, the so uh, I think okay. the heat at the moment. <laughs> Nicole is Probably. back. So, <laughs> sorry about that. The world. Apologies, everybody. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, so, just going, I don't know. Did, did I, is this? Can you share the screen again? And I'll uh, okay. just... Oh, you can't see my screen. Oh, can you share again? Yeah. Uh... Can you see yeah. that now? Yeah, the Australian registry. Probably we just stopped at that point. Yeah. Okay. You can okay. Sorry, apologies. Um, there was a big gust of wind and my connection died. Um, um, so, yeah, so the so registry suggests that patients with mild disease at the same rate of progression at patients compared to more severe disease defined as an FEC cutoff of 80%. And looking at the, uh, this is the impulsus data, this is looking at nintendinib in patients with IPF. Uh, this is looking just the placebo, placebo arms. You can see that on the left are patients are then an FEC of more than 90%, and patients are on the right have FEC of less than 90%. Uh, so more than 90, less than 90, you can see the placebo arms, uh, uh, they had the same rate of decline, irrespective of, of severity of lung function. Okay, so we've shown that, that antifibrotic, so IPF is a terrible disease uh, with irreversible loss of lung function. Um, what about treatment? So we're very lucky now that, that we have treatment in IPF. Uh, so um, we know that both perfenidone and tenonib is effective in reducing disease progression by about 50%. Um, so I generally tell patients, if you're not on drug, you lose about a cup of lung function a year. If you're on the drug, you lose about half a cup of lung function a year. And that's been very well established. Um, we also know, and, and Francesco showed us, that, uh, that nintendinib has been shown to reduce the time to acute exacerbation. We talked about that having one of these is, a, is bad news. Um, and although perfenidone, the trials were not designed to look at that, I think most of us who, who've used this drug for long enough believe that perfenidone also helps reduce exacerbation rates as well. Uh, more importantly, we know that antibiotic therapy is effective irrespective of, of disease severity. Uh, so you've seen this curve before. So we before we were looking at the placebo arms, this is looking at patients on intendinib in the impulses trial in IPF and looking at the, the, the treatment arms. So again, on the left are patients with more than 90% predicted of FEC. On the left is less than 90% predicted of FEC. And again, you can see irrespective of, 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 of severe or, or mild disease, people had the same response uh, in terms of treatment with intendinib. Okay, so patients they progress similarly at the same rate. They also respond uh, regardless of whether they had severe or mild disease. Again, perfenidone trials, patients were definitely excluded. It had FEC of more than 90%. So we patients were not looked at those trials. But, but in reality, with, with, you know, in real life and post-op analysis, data suggests that perfenidone is also effective in patients with mild disease compared to patients with more severe disease as well in IPS. Okay, so, so we talked about the fact that these drugs can slow disease progression down and are, and are effective across the disease spectrum. Um, so we talk about the fact that, that lung function gets worse and patients, patients generally don't feel better, but there are a few patients that do report a benefit with cough. Um, so this is a study um, that was out of um, looking at phenidone on cough in IPF. And this is a multi-center prospective trial out of four sites uh, in, in, the, in Europe. And they looked at 43 patients, those small numbers, but 43 patients who were treatment naive with considerable cough for eight weeks and had cough uh, assessed um, by, by the visual analog score. And so they had data collected at baseline after four and 12 weeks of treatment. And they looked at objective cough, uh, measuring cough with a monitor. And then they looked at uh, cough questionnaires, quality of life questionnaires, and also anxiety and depression questionnaires as well. And what they found uh, was... Um, at baseline compared to 12 weeks, there was significant reduction in cough measured either with a cough meter or even with the questionnaires. Okay, so it's a small study, 
it's only three, it's only 12 weeks or three months, but I think I, I think that the signal is there. And so in my practice, I, people do report that they, the cough gets better with pifendone and also nintedinib. So this is the data for nintedinib. Uh, looking at um, effect of the on cough in IPF. This is the fibronut study. Fibronut study. So this is an observational study as in IPF patients in Italy. Um, again, small numbers. Um, they only had 52 patients, uh, but they were followed three monthly for 12 months. At baseline, um, the percentage of cough was 50%. But at 12 months, that had, that had reduced to 21%. So over the 12-month period, COP had improved uh, in a proportion of patients. Okay, so, so, it's, so these drugs are effective, but they've also been shown to improve survival. And, and Francesco has, 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 has put that very elegantly, um, that both drugs do improve survival. Um, so, 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 so we know the randomized control trials um, show that perfenidone reduces um, all cause mortality and cause uh, and IPF death significantly. Uh, in the Nintendo trials, again, th these trials were not designed to look at survival as a primary endpoint. So these are, are, are done really as, as a post hoc analysis. And in Nintendo, there was a trend to improving survival, uh, which did, but but the um, the hazard ratio across the the ninety five percent um the the zero point of uh, ninety five percent confidence interval. Um, so those are clinical trials, um, but there has been umpteen observation studies uh, looking at, at, at the benefits of perfenidone and intendinib in reducing mortality. Um, now, observational studies are fraught with bias, obviously, but having said that, I think there is a consistent data, consistent um, signal that, that, that mortality is in, in fact improved. And this is from the Australian um, registry data. So the solid line are patients are on antifibrillary therapy, whether perfenidone or nintendinib, and, and the dotted line are patients not on any treatment. And you can see that there is a significant uh, reduction uh, in mortality of 68%. And, and this was also robust after, uh, after controlling for various factors. Okay, so we, we said that it's effective, people live longer, uh, and for the select few that can actually have a lung transplantation, living longer means they have a longer time to wait for suitable lung. It also means they have a longer time to address the comorbidities like reflux, OSA, uh, lung cancer. Again, love with lung cancer, you can't have you can't have cancer within a certain time of transplantation. But it does give them the time to address their other com comorbidities in order to get fit for for surgery. Uh, Last but not least, you know, we know that our job is not done. You know, we still need to have better drugs. Uh, and certainly uh, having been on background therapy gives you a longer time uh, to, to, to participate in, in a clinical trial. And so this, this might be a bridge to better treatments in the future. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that early treatment is indeed worthwhile in IPF. I'm gonna switch tech now to look at um, progressive pulmonary fibrosis or PPF but otherwise previously known as progressive fibrosing ILD. So are, the terms are interchangeable. Um, so back in 2018, Arthur Wells and Kevin Flaherty, both founding fathers of this concept, um, read an opinion piece and they very elegantly titled it, What's in a Name? That which we call IPF, like any other name would 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 um would act the same. So those of you who know Ethel, Ethel loves Shakespeare. So this this, this reeks of Shakespeare language, basically. And what he's saying in, in the opinion piece is um so so there is a subgroup of patients in other forms of ILD, which are not IPF, that, that manifest the same progressive phenotype. Um, and these patients have been uh, have been called progressive fibrosing elbilized um well, fibros for PPF. OPFRD, and this is despite optimal treatment. And as Francesco said, this actually goes back to probably more than 10 years now. So back in 2013, Athol put, put this um, uh, classification of, of ILD, looking at disease behavior rather than etiology, looking at how to manage patients uh, in a way that's dictated by the disease behavior. So again, this concept really has gone back more than 10 years. Again, so is PPF benign? No, it's not. In fact, it has the same poor prognosis as, as IPF and the same disease trajectory. So this is looking at uh, change in FEC over 52 weeks in the placebo arms of the IPF trials and the PFRD trials, so the inbuilt trial and the impulses trial. 
So the black line is impulses, so this is change in lung function over 52 weeks. You can see the, in IPF, they have a full lung function. And in the inbuilt trials, so with the PPF or the PFRD cohort, irrespective of whether they have UIP or non-UIP, they had the same trajectory of disease behavior compared to people with IPF. All right, so that's trial data. What about real life data? So this is taken out of Justin Odom's uh, paper, which was actually published uh, early this year, uh, last month to be exact. Uh, and they looked at uh, two cohorts, one in the US, one in the UK, and it was a retrospective analysis of about 1,300 patients. And what they did is look, they looked at the survival of IPF patients, which is in red, compared to people uh, patients with non-IPF fibroid ILD, uh, which are these three lines here. As you can see, as a whole group, people with non-IPF fibroid ILD had, a, had better prognosis compared to patients uh, with IPF. However, if you look at people had, who had the progressive phenotype, so these are people who had progressed even regardless of, of, of optimal treatment, and you looked at those cohort only, they had the same poor prognosis compared to people with IPF. That's a real world data. So what diseases cause PPF? Um, and this is taken out um, from the guideline paper, but this is really taken out from a survey of international speakers as to what they thought made up PPF. And you can see the um, vast majority um, came from HP and CTLD, but, but really, in fact, the progressive phenotype can occur in any, any form of, uh, any form of uh, uh, ILD as well. Uh, looking at the uh, breakdown in inbuilt, which is the, the um, profenogen, sorry, nintendinib in PFRD trial. Again, the predominant, uh, so there was obviously a breakdown of different diagnoses, but the predominant most common was in fact, again, chronic HP and autoimmune diseases. So they made up almost half the population of the phenotype of progressive progression, despite um, best management. So, if anything, you know, you would have known by now there is no consensus definition uh, of, of, of progression in, in PPF. Um, so as Francesca has, has said, this is the ATS guideline uh, and the definition of, of, of progression is uh, at least two of the three following within the last 12 months. So worsening symptoms, worsening physiology, but an absolute decline of efficacy of more than 5% or absolute decline of DLC of more than 10%. And then obviously radiology as well. So basically within 12 months, two out of three, and the different and absolute decline um, of FEC or DLCO. Uh, and then there is an inbuilt trial criteria, which, which a lot of us are familiar by now. Uh, and they dictate that you have to have a progression within 24 months. So you don't have to wait 24 months, but you can progress within 24 months. And this is despite, again, optimal management. Uh, and they have to have one or more of the criteria. So you could have a standalone relative decline of FEC by itself, or relative decline of FEC of between five and nine percent, and worsening symptoms, or relative decline of five to nine percent with disease extent, uh, which is worsened, or combination of symptoms uh, and and disease extent uh, on CT. Uh, again, those are trial criteria. What about real world data? So this comes back to the same paper that was present, I presented earlier with Justin Odom's group. Uh, again, so this is a retrospective uh, study looking at uh, two cohorts uh, of over 1300 patients. And the most common uh, was in fact CTD ILD or autoimmune ILD. And they followed patients for up to four years for, to look for progression. And looked at the association between transplant free survival at five years, and FEC decline of 10% or more relative decline. And then separately, they looked at 13 other criteria as listed here. And they, they include all the combinations of what we talked about before. And in fact, the most powerful predictor was a standalone relative decline in FEC of more than 10%. Okay, you can see the hazards ratio here of 3.11 uh, across both cohorts. Um, so thankfully, that's what we use in clinical practice. And in fact, that appears to be the more, more robust measure of prediction uh, and, and a worse outcome. Um, this In the same publication in January this year, um, yet call from my group published um, data from the, the our, our Austin Hospital um, Registry uh, in combination with the Canadian Registry as well. They looked at over 700 patients with non-IPF PPF. And they compared um, patients with IPF in, 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 the, in the cohort and looked at whether it was um, whether um, they used um, definitions of 
of gut of of uh, of progression using the gum, how their survival dif differ between patients uh, with PPF and IPF. So they looked at the four uh, definitions were the ATS ERS guideline definition, the in the this is a trial that looked at methadone in patients with unclassifiable RD, and the definition was a decline of efficacy of more than 5% or significant symptom progression within six months. So you could actually progress without actually confirming you had um, a physiological decline. And the, and the relief trial, as you, as you had heard from Francesco, was a, a phenodon trial, uh, which was terminated early because of difficulty recruitment during COVID. But nevertheless, that was a positive study. And so what it showed was a significant proportion of people actually met decline uh, with an FEC of more than 10%. And the most common PPF was, in fact, the autoimmune ILD as well. Uh, and if you look at, um, this is the survival curve, um, five years five years survival, transplant free survival over time. The red line are patients with IPF, uh, and, and these were the three other trials. And this here is the unclassifiable ILD trial. So this is the this is the only trial where patients actually had a better outcome compared to the to, to the other definitions here. And perhaps this is due to the fact how patients were recruited. So they had to decline within six months, and they, they only had to decline. Uh, in symptoms and not necessarily have to prove they actually decline physiologically as well. Okay, so how long should patients be monitored for progression? So the studies have used a range of between six months and four years. And this is data from my center. It's obviously a single center study of non-IPF PPF patients. Uh, so all of the 118 patients with um, non-IPF non RD, uh, under half of them had progressed using the inbuilt criteria. And in fact, most of them have progressed based on a decline of, of FEC of more than 10% relative decline. And whilst we talk about um, six to four years, we found that uh, about 20% of patients, well, more than 20% of patients, so this is looking at proportion of patients and, and the time to decline, more than 20% of patients, in fact, had declined after four years of, of diagnosis. What does this tell us? This tells us that, again, like IPA, this is highly variable. Uh, and whilst decline is more relevant in the first couple of years, I think you should still monitor patients in the longer term, perhaps every six to 12 months. So in summary, early treatment in IPF is really worthwhile. And it's because of IPF, it's the nature of IPF being chronic and, 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 and irreversible uh, and, and highly, uh, highly variable and unpredictable. And now we have treatments that can uh, impact on uh, survival, on, on disease progression, on acute exacerbation, and in some patients' cough. Um, there is no current consensus definition of progression in PPF, although a standalone uh, definition of more than 10% in FEC decline, relative fleece decline appears to be the most robust outcome measure. Early, IP, early treatment in PPF is really worthwhile, and we've shown that PPF pretends the same core prognosis as compared to patients with IPF. And Anne is going to uh, tell us about treatments uh, for PPF uh, with endophobic therapy. Thank you very much. Thanks, Professor Nicole. So um, very timely that uh, we can move on to the next uh, speaker, Professor Anna uh, Maria Hoffman, to bring us to the um, treatment of um, PPF. Good morning, Professor Anna. Can you share your slides? With the screen? Good morning, everyone. Uh, can you see my slides now? Yes, we can. Presentation, okay. now, please. Yes. So thank you very much for the kind introduction and the kind invitation to talk here today. I'm very much looking forward uh, to present some data and then also discuss with uh, Nicole and Francisco afterwards. Um, so um, I will talk about how does existing evidence guide clinical practice in, uh, in PPF. And I was very interested in what Nicole just showed us uh, from the Canadian and UK uh, data on PPF, also in autoimmune disease. I will also show you before I talk about treatment, uh, some data from our cohort. And I'm very much looking forward to discuss later on and get all your questions, why there might be some difference in the different cohorts. So, um, but I would like to start actually asking the audience um, two questions. And the first question, question is, which definition criteria are you using to determine disease progression today? So are you really in clinical practice? Are you taking the um, criteria from inbuilt? So the progressive fibrosing ILD, 
Do you use um, the new guidelines, the new ATS, ERS, GRS, ALAT clinical practice guidelines for PPF, or do you have your own uh, guidelines? Uh, so please start answering. And then the second question will be, how often do you monitor for progressive disease in your uh, systemic sclerosis or even more CTD, ILD patients? And again, I was very struck by the data Nicole showed because this is also my clinical experience and we also showed this in SSC ILD. So please all vote. First, which definition? And then second, how often do you monitor patients? So could we see the results, please? Yes, well, I'm actually impressed. And this is also worthwhile a discussion later on. So uh, most of you are actually already using the progressive pulmonary fibrosis definitions by ATS. Uh, it's two thirds of all them um, answered. And uh, most of you are actually um, monitoring your patients every three to six months. That's impressive. So thank you for your answers and uh, looking forward to even more discussions later on. So I think, um, and this has been partly shown by Francesco and also Nicole, but I will only talk about I, uh, autoimmune IOD. So I'm in comparison to the other speakers, I'm a rheumatologist. So if you have questions, ask me about autoimmune IODs, not about IPF and others. So, and I think it is important um, because now the concepts really lump all the diseases into one. So CTD, ILD, autoimmune IODs is, a part of PPF, a part of uh, PFILD, a part of trials. But I think uh, at least for rheumatologists, it is worthwhile to really extract data on only autoimmune IODs. And I think we need to ask ourselves first, is progression meaningful? Are we talking about a meaningful thing here? Are we talking about when we treat these patients with potential side effects, with um, other complications? Is it meaningful to treat them? And there is a really the answer, yes. So first, there are many, many studies. This is only one of them showing that a decline in lung function is associated with mortality. These are data from the scleroderma lung study where they even compared is baseline FEC or declining FEC the strongest predictor for mortality. And it was very clearly decline in FEC, also compared to DLCO, compared to everything. So fits also very well what Nicole just showed us with a more than 10%. But here it's really an absolute FEC decline is associated with mortality, strongest predictor. This is also true for RAILD. So if you have RAILD, this is a study from Clive Kelly from the UK. If you have ILD and RA, the likelihood to die is two times higher than not having declining ILD or declining FEC. So strong predictor, yes, has an impact for, um, for us. Then also there's a new study, which I also think is very striking, especially now in the times of PPF and PFIL definitions, where we combine not only lung function, but also HRCT findings and worsening of symptoms. So this again is a study from the SLS, the scleroderma lung study one, where they looked at a quantification of HRCT images and whether a minimal change of 2%, this is a change which we don't see with our eyes. This is really an automated um, quantification which we need to detect such small changes. And even such a small change is associated with mortality. As you see here, the blue line, more than 2% um, worsening of uh, ILD extent is a, a higher predictor or having a less extent increase of 2%. So again, yes, progression is meaningful, both an FEC decline and HRCT progression. And this is, again, also just to show you, because most data are actually derived from SSC, and this is due to that the SSC community has been strong in publishing a lot, and, and the others have not published that much, and it has also not been that much focus. RA has been a more and more focus, but the other... Uh, CTDs have not been so much in focus. But again, when we look here at the clinical trials, the autoimmune ILD from the inbuilt trial compared to the non-IPF from inbuilt and the impulses IPF patients, all the placebo groups, so untreated patients, how do they decline over a year? And of course, IPF prototype uh, progressive lung disease has the strongest or the most uh, prominent FEC decline, but look at the autoimmune ILDs, not far away. So yes, it is meaningful 
to prote uh, protect progression. They progress a lot and it is associated with mortality. So then I think it is important before we talk about treatment to really know how often do they progress. And again, Nicole showed us also um, that these patients progress late stage. We showed the same in SSC, but we still need to know if we have 100 patients in our clinics, how many of them will decline or uh, show, FEC, um, show FEC decline, ILD progression, any definition in the following year? So that we have um, help how to monitor these patients. There again, we have most data from SSC. We have some other data, which I will show you. So here, these are data from the USTA database, world's largest network for SSC patients, more than 20,000 patients registered. And we looked at the SSC ILD patients over a one year period. How many did show ILD progression? Here it was defined as here in red, FEC declined more than 10% or FEC declined between uh, um, five and 9%. And you see all together, about a third of the patient will be progressive. And this is a number which will go again and again and again. So for clinical practice, it means if you have 100 patients, 30 of them or 33%, uh, 33 patients will progress showing FEC decline in the following year. And this is very important, I think, uh, in clinical practice. But of course, then again, we want to know um, not only for one year, because this is a multi-organ disease which lasts over years and years. So we wanted to see how many of these patients who are progressive in the first year, here 146, will progress in the next year. And here you see that most of these patients will be stable in the following year, 112 patients. Um, the ones who will be progressive also in the second year, also only 21. If you look at these patients who progressed in the first and second year, only 1% will be progressive in the following year, in the third year. So this means that in clinical practice, you will hardly see patients, you do have these patients, but very hardly see patients who act like IPF, who are really progressive in every single year. And this makes it, of course, very challenging for clinical practice, because if you have a patient who progresses and you wait until you treat them, you will lose the window of opportunity to prevent ILD progression. You will first treat once they have lost um, lung function. And we have shown already that this is associated directly with mortality. So, and this is something we wanted to show in a different study when we saw these results, because here it just looks like it may be that even lung function decline is protective for the second year. And this is what we did in the next study. And yes, this was actually true. So we showed that if you have an FEC decline more than 5% in one year, this is actually protective for FEC decline in the following year, as you see here. So this has a major implication for clinical practice and treatment initiation for us because waiting for progression really misses treatment opportunities because most of these patients will not be progressive in the second year. And I'm very much looking forward to discuss this with you also how we actually can implement this in clinical practice because it is not that easy. We don't find these patients so easy before they progress. And this is something we as a community taking care of these patients need to discuss and come up with um, some good ideas. We talk about progression. We also need to talk about UIP pattern and especially in RAILD. The other CTTs that has not been proven that this is really a risk factor for progression, but for UIP and for RA, there are coming more and more studies. And one of them is the TRAIL study, which I will come and go uh, to later. Here you see the patients who had UIP pattern over a one year period and were on placebo. They had the strongest decline of FEC over one year period here in orange or there the orange curve. So if you have an RAILD patient in your clinic with a UIP pattern, be especially uh, worried about progression, which does not mean don't be worried for the other patterns, right? So you can't transfer that to the other way. But if you have a UIP pattern, be especially worried for progression. And then um, there's a new disease, or oh, it's not a new disease, but it's a disease which I personally find uh, more interesting um, in, in the recent years. And this is uh, primary Sjogren syndrome with ILD. And here there's really, these patients have never been included in any study. So we have no clue how to treat them. We know that we do need to treat some of them, but we don't know how because they've never been included in clinical trials. 
So we, what we did in the Oslo cohort, we looked at all of our patients. We have 700 children's patients in our local registry and 60 of them had ILD. We cannot say that the other 640 did not because not all of them have an HRCT, but at least we identified 60 with a uh, HRCT verified interstitial lung disease. And when we followed them for one year, we saw that 21% had an FEC decline more than 5%, um, 32 had an LCO decline more than 10%, and 45% had ILD progression on HRCT. This was not over a one year period, but over about five years. And um, this is actually wrong. Um, it should stay a reticular pattern because when we looked at which factors were associated with um, um, ILD progression, we so showed that this was a reticular pattern. It was a baseline FEC DLCO and also some inflammation and extra pulmonary Sjögren's manifestations and male sex. So again, also, if you follow Sjögren's patients in your clinic, it's roughly, again, a third which uh, progresses over a one-year period. And um, these need to be identified. And then very shortly, because Nicole has been very nicely shown this, but I really want to show you some of the data from our SSC cohorts and also some from our C purely CTD ILD cohorts from the rheumatology perspective, because there may be actually a difference whether a pulmonologist or a rheumatologist follows these patients, how selected for severity these patients are. I don't know. This is worth a discussion, and I'm very much looking forward to discuss with Francesco and Nicole afterwards. But um, we also wanted to know uh, how does PFILD, so the inbuilt criteria and the CT uh, and PPF, the ATS guideline criteria, perform in CTD ILD. I don't know, go into these details. You have seen them. A progressive fibrosing ILD needs to show a period of progressive disease within 24 months of the composite score of lung function, HRCT, and um, respiratory symptoms worsening. And the PPF guidelines, they need to, or here you need to have two out of three um, domains which progress over a one-year period. And here, an absolute FEC decline more than 10% only not qualify to be a PPF because you need to also have worsening of symptoms or radiological changes. But I think it's very uh, worthwhile discussion as well. So what we did in our SSC cohorts, we had um, two very well defined cohorts, the Oslo and the Zurich cohort, and we looked at how many patients do fulfill the different definitions. So 31 over one year period would have an FEC decline more than 5%. Again, the 30% comes up in the guide. PFILD, 39%, but again, remember here, the observation period would be up to 24 uh, months if they do not progress in the first year. So we also expect to identify some more patients. And then what I think is very interesting, PPF, we only identify 19 patients. So if we use the PPF guideline criteria, we actually do not identify all progressors, which we would identify using the other criteria. Then we have, we see here in the Venn diagram that several of the um, uh, progressive patients, of course, fulfill several um, definitions, but some also only uh, fulfill one of the progression criteria. And then, as I showed you, we always need to um, test whether a definition is associated with mortalities, because then we know whether it has a meaningful impact for our patients. And um, this you saw also uh, with Nicole, where the patients or whether subgroups included CTD ILD patients. So here it's a pure SSC ILD cohort. And we see an FEC decline more than 5% is um, uh, significantly associated with mortality and um, compared to the patients who do not progress over more than 5%. And I think also the 5 and 10% thresholds is really something we need to discuss because we do not see these many patients with SSC ILD who uh, um, decline more than 10% FEC in a one year period. Um, as you saw in the Venn diagram over one year, it's only 12%, while five per, uh, more than 5%, it's 30%. And directly associated with mortality. For clinical practice, it means you need to start worrying when these patients um, progress more than 5%. Don't wait until they have progressed 10% uh, FEC decline. Then we also tested the mortality in uh, PFILD, so the inbuilt criteria on the left and the PPF ATS guideline criteria on the right. And the curves would look very much the same. 
what is interesting is when you look at the p-value, and I'm totally aware of that we should not only look at the p-value, but I think it is interesting here, the PPF do not predict mortality. And I think this is worthwhile to discuss and worthwhile also to test in more cohorts because is this only due to the lower N? I showed you it's only 19%. Or is this something which is true for SSC? We don't know yet, but there is clearly a difference by which criteria you use in your clinical practice. And many of you were saying you're using the PPF criteria in clinical practice already. So just be aware of that we really need to see that these also very meaningfully predict mortality in our CTDLD patients, including SSE patients. And then we also looked at um, these different criteria in our entire CTD ILD cohort from the Oslo cohort and the Swiss cohort. We had 550 patients roughly. And you see over one year period, this was a random period because we identified the patients who had consecutive serial FECs. So they had short and long disease duration, positive, negative for antibodies, totally different. But these would also be patients which would be recruited into clinical practice. Um, what we need to say here is also you see the immunosuppression, some of the diseases such as um, um, uh, antisyndetic syndrome, a large amount of the patient is actually treated. So, of course, there are differences. But when you see both the absolute FEC decline over 12 months here, the first row in the um, red mark box, very heterogeneous. Um, Sjogren's disease was the disease with the strongest FEC decline here of more than 2.4%. And while RA in this year had an, even an improvement in lung function tests. When we look at how many patients fulfilled the FEC more than 10% decline criteria and um, the PPF guideline criteria, you see huge differences. So again, here, um, primary Sjogren's syndrome and um, uh, here, antisyntetic syndrome show quite meaningful amount of patients progressing, while again, RA this year have a less decline. And I think this is just important for us to remember, don't always just lump them all together. These patients behave different based on the underlying rheumatic disease. For clinical trials, it's amazing that we can merge them because it's the first time these patients will also be included in clinical trials. But in clinical practice, we need to be careful that they don't all behave the same way. So now, last part of my talk, how does this translate into clinical management? So what does this mean? I showed you it's meaningful that they progress. I showed you many of them progress over time. I showed you that progression does not predict further progression. And this is super important because we need to identify these patients before they progress to not lose the window of opportunity for treatment. So what kind of treatment options do we have available and when do we initiate them? But we do have um, suggestions, uh, recommendations for the treatment of SSC ILD. These were published now three years ago. However, for the other CTD ILDs, we don't have them currently. We are working at the ERS and EULA for a combined treatment guideline for CTD ILD, and hopefully they will be published later this year. But at this time point, we only have the SSC ILD guidelines. And you see here several treatment options are, um, included, such as MMF, cyclophosphamide, nintiodanib as mono combination therapy for initiation. And for escalation therapy, again, my MMF cyclophosphamide, if not appropriate in the first round, rituximab, stem cell transplant, lung transplant, again, nintedanib here. So many different options. And why were they included here? And um, cyclophosphamide and mycophenolide are really based on the scleroderma lung study one and two. Um, where the cyclophosphamide in the scleroderma lung study one was compared to placebo. After one year of treatment with cyclophosphamide, there was a meaningful and um, good improvement of FEC compared to placebo. However, after the second year, there was no treatment uh, difference between cyclophosphamide and placebo. And this is, of course, always a problem with cyclophosphamide. It's so toxic, we only give it for a year. So if we don't give main maintenance treatment as they did here in the study, um, most of the patients will actually decline again later on. Then in the scleroderma lung study two, they wanted to prove that MMF is better than cyclophosphamide in SSC ILD. This was not shown. 
So this was a negative study and not placebo controlled. Very important because we use MMF a lot, but the evidence is actually not placebo controlled. However, what they showed is it's much less toxicity and it also both with MMF and cyclophosphamide had a treatment efficacy on the skin and the lung. And this is super important for us rheumatologists. We also treat other organs. So these um, both treatments targeted also skin. But here, no progression definition was included. So these were patients regardless, progression, yes or no. But here, we have two treatment options which have been validated in clinical trials for SSCILD. So we need to place them somewhere. Then a very interesting study was the uh, FOCUS study with tozolizumab, a phase three study where patients were randomized to tozolizumab or placebo. These patients, the primary endpoint was the skin. Um, these patients did not need to have ILD, but more than 70% of these patients had ILD. So the key secondary endpoint was the, um, was the lung, luckily, because the primary endpoint was negative. So tozolizumab did not have a significant efficacy treatment on the, lung, uh, on the skin. But when we look at the lung, we saw something very, very specific. When you look here at the placebo group in blue, these patients on placebo declined so much compared to the stabilized treatment efficacy of tozolizumab that the difference was 170 mils nearly. So again, the same difference, which I showed you from the all autoimmune IODs in the placebo group of, um, of inbuilt. So we do also have these patients who strongly progress in SSC over a short period. And when we need to know how to implement this in clinical practice, how can we identify this subgroup before they progress? This is super important because these patients lose a lot of lung function if we don't treat them. What can we do? Well, we can apply the inclusion criteria of the trial. So when we look here, what was very specific for this trial is they all had a short disease duration, they all had diffuse skin, needed to have a certain skin, which means that because we have shown this in several studies that um, skin disease, progressive skin disease is a marker for um, ILD progression over time. So if you have a patient in your clinic who still has exploding skin disease, these patients and early disease are the ones which we need to worry also for the lung. And then they also had active disease with increased CRP and they were not on background uh, therapy. So what this translates in clinical practice, if you have a patient with short disease duration, active skin disease, active inflammatory disease, these patients need to be treated early before they progress. And here in this study, it was tozolizumab. So this is how you can use the inclusion criteria for doing the right clinical management approach and how you can do what I just presented initially, prevent progression and prevent organ damage. And the census trial was the largest study ever conducted in SSC um, ILD. Nearly 600 patients were included here. And this study had very different inclusion criteria. Here, everyone was more or less allowed. They needed to have an HSCT extent more than 10%. While well, that is not much, they could have a disease duration up to seven years. And remember what Nicole also showed you. These patients are also progressive late stage. So it makes sense to include them also at later stage diseases. Um, so, but what it also translated into is that there was not much of an enrichment for disease progression. And this is what you can see in the placebo group. Because compared to the placebo group of all the trials I've shown you, the other trials um, uh, which Nintedani uh, um, used, so inbuilt and impulses, this placebo group only lost 90 milliliters over one year period, not 200, not 180. And uh, therefore, the difference was only 41 milliliters. But really, remember what I told you. This is a medication used for a majority of patients with SSC IRD. And also what is important for clinical practice is that the census trial did not include patients who needed to pre progressive prior inclusion, such as inbuilt did. So nintedanib can be used in SSC patients also from any time point. SSC ILD patients do not need to be progressive before you initiate um, nintedanib. Very different to the inbuilt criteria. And then I think there's a very, very interesting study, which was very recently. I, I actually, I have the wrong uh, reference here because I got yesterday the notice that it's now online published in RMD Open. So what we did here is we also applied 
the um, risk factors or the inclusion criteria from the focus trial on Nintedanib or on the census trial. So how did patients in the census trial with short disease duration hair, with um, inflammatory markers and with a certain rotten skin score, which is still showing rapid skin uh, progression in census trial. And what you see here, patients from census with a short disease duration also lost nearly 170 milliliters when they had short disease duration. Super important because these patients who were treated with nintedanib then, they had a difference of 110 milliliters. So this means, of course, it's not powered, it's a post hoc analysis, many, many drawbacks, but it gives us a hint that nintedanib is not only a treatment for late stage disease, it is very efficacious also early in the disease course. And this is, again, something which we need to remember for clinical practice. For SSC ILD, we do not wait to um, wait until progression before we initiate nintedanib, and we can also use it in early stage disease. Then another thing which is very important, especially for us rheumatologists who treat a lot of patients also for skin disease, arthritis, other organ manifestations, in the sense this trial background me uh, medication with mycophenolate was allowed. And uh, about half of the patients did use mycophenolate. And when you see patients on the left side here who where nintedanib was added to mycophenolate, um, it really looked like a good um, combination or add-on therapy with nintedanib. These patients only lost 40 milliliters compared an example to the placebo group who did not use anything of 119 mils. Again, remember post hoc. Uh, well, this was pre-specified, but still the study is not powered to look at combination or add-on therapy. But I think, again, for clinical practice, an important thing to remember that it looks both safe and efficacious to add nintedanib on top of MMF. Uh, I really would like to jump over this in due time. So I will talk um, in the last minutes about the inbuilt study, which... Uh, has been presented before and you all know the data, but I only want to talk about the 170 patients who had autoimmune ILD. When you look here in dark blue, these patients had mostly RA ILD, then some had SSC ILD, MCTD ILD, and other autoimmune ILDs. That is important to also uh, look at the results. So this is the first trial ever, which included also other autoimmune ILDs than SSC ILD. And that is really the largest evidence we have for treatment for these patients. And this is important to remember. Then, of course, it is important to remember that these patients had the inclusion criteria of PFILD. So these patients, prior being included in the study, needed to show progression with any of the three different combinations. So different than in census. Again, very interesting. This, patient, uh, this study was a positive study. You see that, again, the placebo group, um, and I showed you the data before, lost 180 mils. For the Nintedanib group, um, about 76 mils. The difference was about 103 mils. So a meaningful reduction of FEC decline and a significant decline. Super interesting for us um, in the autoimmune disease. And then again, it is important because the first subgroup, which was uh, um, published also by Arthur Wells, showed that none of the large major groups in inbuilt drove the efficacy of an intedapsinib. So it wasn't HP, it wasn't the autoimmune ILDs, it wasn't the unclassifiable. So all of them um, had the same amount of efficacy on the primary endpoint and the positive trial. The same was done here in the autoimmune ILDs. So this is the interaction by subgroup by time uh, interaction analysis. It shows that none of the uh, autoimmune ILDs drove the efficacy of the whole group. It doesn't mean that the treatment is similar. We can't say this because they were all lumped together. But we can say that none of the groups really drove the efficacy. And that is important to say um, and to, to understand. Uh, because otherwise, if only RAILD would have been driving the efficacy, then we couldn't say much about the other diseases. So we can, in this regard, say that we can look at it as a whole group uh, for the use of nintedanib in progressive patients with autoimmune ILD. 
Also in this study, um, the background therapy was not allowed if it affected the lung. So much stricter than in the census trial, unfortunately, because we treat these patients very often with other diseases. But for the underlying autoimmune di disease, they were allowed to use um, DMARTs or steroids um, in a low dose. So again, we looked at patients who had or who were in background therapy, such as uh, steroids here in 88%, and non-biological DMARDs, 47%, and uh, biological DMARDs, and 15%. And when we looked at the results, um, there was not such a nice pattern as for MMF and census, but clearly it looks safe to add nintedanib uh, on, the, uh, on the use of DMARDs or steroids, no um, significant differences assessed. Again, important for us because we often need to treat the underlying CTD. And two more uh, very short trials. One is the recital study. Um, here, a lot of or, or different uh, diseases here, such as myositis, MCTD, and systemic sclerosis were included and randomized to cyclophosphamide or rituximab. The aim was to show that rituximab was better than cyclophosphamide. However, this primary endpoint was not met. They showed that rituximab was as efficacious cyclophosphamide at primary endpoint in 24 weeks and at 48 weeks. So what does this for clinical practice mean? It means that we now finally, finally have a larger rituximab trial where we show um, treatment efficacy because we have used it in clinical practice for many years, but without a large RCT. We have the DESIRE study from Japan having about um, 26 patients in each arm, but now we have a larger study, not placebo controlled, but compared to cyclophosphamide. So this again helps us um, as well to use um, rituximab in clinical practice. And the toxicity profile was better in rituximab patients, not surprisingly. And the last trial is the TRAIL study who looked at perfinidon in patients with RAILD. Here again, these patients did not be progressive, need to, needed to be progressive, not in the recital trial either. Uh, um, so both Rituximab and cyclophosphamide do not wait, need to wait until patients are progressive before we can initiate it. So in the perfinidon trial, the same. Um, again, here, stable background RA treatment was allowed. Um, otherwise, no major differences or no major inclusion criteria. Unfortunately, that study was majorly underpowered. They say it's due to COVID. It may also be that it is more difficult than everyone thinks to identify these patients because it is not that frequent. Um, but it is uh, tremendously important to identify. So uh, um, underpowered study, the primary endpoint this is really the first ILD study in autoimmune ILDs who did not use an absolute FEC decline over one year period as the primary endpoint, but a categorical endpoint of more than 10%. And unfortunately, they used this um, endpoint because it was negative. So this is also a study underpowered and negative primary endpoint. But if you look at the secondary endpoint, and you have seen this uh, slide before, a tremendous treatment effect also of perfinidone in these patients. On the whole group, they lost 140 mils in the placebo group, 66 mils in the um, perfinidone group with a just a, a estimated difference of 80 mils, uh, which again, of course, uh, has an impact on patients. And then you have seen this before. No, I have it here. These patients with a UIP pattern had an even uh, stronger treatment efficacy of perfinidone. So of course, Underpowered, primary endpoint negative, but very important data uh, also for RAILD with a treatment of perfenidone. So we really have many different managements uh, or treatment options available for these patients. Um, as I told you, use the inclusion criteria and what we have known in example here with the UIP pattern on on. on on um, HRCT, such as early disease, such as imploding, uh, exploding skin disease, use these criteria to identify patients for the right treatment and also when to start treatment so that we really don't lose the window of opportunity and can prevent organ damage rather than starting only treatment once these patients have progressed. 
So my take-home messages are progressive ILD is frequent in autoimmune diseases associated with a poor outcome. It, the prevalence of uh, progression and clinical characteristics characteristics really differ based on which progression definition you use. So most of you were using the PPF uh, guideline criteria. Remember that you will identify less patients if you strictly use them as if you only use FEC decline. This is important for clinical practice. And in our study with SSC ILD, the PF ILD criteria and FEC decline, even a small FEC decline such as 5% associated with worse outcome compared to PPF. Treatment of ILD with autoimmune disease is important. Um, we have seen it has a major impact on our patients once they progress. And we do have immunosuppressives and antifibrotics available now for treatment. And prevention of progression should be the treatment goal, not waiting until they progress and lose um, lung function and have organ damage. Thank you very much for listening to me. And I'm very much looking forward to some nice discussion. Thank you, Prof. Anna, and all the ILD experts. I'm not sure about participants talking about are uh, they getting smarter. I feel smarter already after this <laughs> half an hour, one and a half hours of so much of information, that's, and there's a lot of questions in my head. But I think we get um, a few questions um, coming in. So the participants, please key in your questions, and you can uh, share it with the experts. A very quick um, to the three of the speakers that I have in my mind. Again, if you go into specifically into the FEC decline, and I can see there's some question coming in, is the 5% absolute FEC decline or the 10% relative FEC decline plays the most crucial role or are we missing something here? Because again, because we are talking about two schools of thought, whether it's um, inbuilt criteria or the PPF guideline criteria, right? Um, probably, can we start with Professor Francesco? Then I just want to get a feel. This is a very question. old question because uh, the debate between relative and absolute decline in FEC and even in DSCO um, has a no clear answer. So uh, we, we always know that the absolute decline is more precise, more accurate than the relative decline in identifying uh, progression of disease. But as we stressed in the German guidelines, we also look at other things. Yeah, If you have a 5% absolute decline, for example, or a 10% relative decline, we look also at this desaturation of patients on uh, other exercise. Um, we tend to repeat the HRCT, so there is a very nice study by Justin Aldam about the predictors of progression, and they show very clearly that the HRCT progression of fibrotic lesions, fibrotic infiltrates, is the strongest predictor versus uh, uh, the decline in lung function there. So, I mean, <clears throat> we focus our talks, of course, on the available evidence, and this is most for FEC and declining lung function, but you have to consider other parameters uh, to define progression in your patients. So even symptoms and patients reported outcome will have uh, a greater impact in the future for the definition of progression. Yeah, I think, in, I mean, in clinical practice, I mean, again, you know, we use the inbuilt guidelines because that's how we access drug. Um, and that's for regulatory and, and pragmatic purposes. But I think in clinical practice, we would, you know, we would use, you know, a, a combination of, you know, morphological and physiological and, and symptoms to guide us. I think it's really important to note that we talk about, you know, five, 10 percent decline, but, you know, that, that's within the technical variation of the tests. And, you know, Francesco and I respiratory physicians and, and uh, in, in people that not actually get breathless, we'd repeat the lung function again in four to six weeks and, and, it, and it goes up again. So I think it's really important that you don't use one measure in the absence of any collateral history or change in morphology to actually base, you know, progression. So I would I would. You know, if they said definitely getting worse and the lung function was worse and, and if you do a CT it's worse, yeah, that's real. But I think if in the absence of actually any clinical deterioration, I would repeat the lung function in four to six weeks time. Lena? I, of course, I, I totally agree with both of you. And we can't just say, oh, this patient has progressed or lost 5% FEC. We 
this is progression. I totally agree, of course. And uh, this is what we do in clinical practice. We ask the patients and we, we, we map the patients. But I think what is important to remember is, especially for the autoimmune, and I, I, as I said, I'm a rheumatologist, I don't treat the other ILDs, but what is important in our patients at least is they adapt very quickly to their lifestyle, their lifestyles. So if they feel they, they um, have, they're getting worse, they're getting less active. So I think it's very important to ask the patients the right way. So are you as active as you were? Um, are you still walking as fast as you did? Because if you only ask, are you more dyspneic or how is it compared to last year? They may say I'm stable, but I think it's very, very crucial to really ask them about their daily activity also to really get an idea or even ask their spouse, caregivers whatsoever, are they still the same? Because I experience very often in clinical practice that the patients do not report more dyspnea or more cough if we only ask this. And I think the other problem is that um, in my center, we are very, and I, I think that's what I understood from Nicole and Francesco as well. We are very active and also referring back to HRCT. So we will get quite some imaging data as well, which we can use to assess um, progression. But this is actually not for all centers. So many centers don't repeat um, the HRCT so often that they can use the combined uh, with FEC decline and uh, changes on HRCT patterns. Mm -hmm. So I think um, this is also something for clinical practice. Not every country can refer as they want to um, images. So then we are left with clinical um, symptoms and the, um, the lung function test. And I think what is the most important is just to don't think it's not progression if a patient loses more than 5% FEC. So then rather refer them quickly back to lung function and do determine, is this real? Is the patient improving again? So just map it and don't think it's not worth it because it's only five. And I think the question- can I, can you, well, Sorry, can I just say something that's very quickly? I think this so is I think, really you know, would be my major. Yeah. yeah. Just with serial lung function measurements, often if you measure the last one and then it says, you know, minor decline, but I think it's really important it's, if it's possible to, to actually map and track yeah. your lung function, you know, over, you know, 6, 12, 18 months, 24 months, because often if you look back to the previous one, there's a very small drop. But if you look at the, the trend, that gives you a lot of information, I think. Yeah. So I think regular follow up, you know, three to six months and look at the trend across time, not just between yeah. the last measurement. Very important point. Francesco, Professor? Uh, yes, I, I want to, to bring the discussion in another direction. So uh, I really appreciate the talk of uh, Maria, but we are missing a chance at the moment. So uh, all the trials presented today didn't collect historical data of the patients. And so when we when we state that the census trial was not focused on progressive patients, we don't know that. We don't know what happened in these patients in the past. So we have to be very careful to draw conclusions on progression uh, or non-progression in these patients, including the trial, because the lack of historical data is, uh, uh, is not acceptable anymore in the future. So this is a major difference with oncology they really collect historical data and they say they had the first line treatment, the second line treatment, the third line treatment, then enter the new trial because of progression or because there's particular situation of the tumor and so on. So I think this is what we have to do in the future uh, to characterize or stratify the patients more clearly. Otherwise the conclusions are all, are all dirty. Yeah and uh, the patient's population are dirty. So I think this is a risk and uh, this is a missed miss chance also to, uh, to have um, more precise data what the meaning of progression is for each subtype of ILD. <clears throat> but Francesco, I think there's a very important difference between census and inbuilt because inbuilt, these patients needed to have a verified um, progression. So here, only patients were included who were progressive within 24 months before inclusion. This is a very huge difference to census because in census, patients were allowed anyway. So they could have been stable for 10 years and they could have been progressive. So 
there's a subgroup, but the inclusion criteria were not based and on progression. And I think this is super important to understand also for prescribing nintedanib in these patients, because for the other autoimmune ILDs, um, as Nicole also um, said, I think in Australia, right, you need to have um, the fulfillment of the criteria before you can prescribe it. But this is different in SSC ILD because the inclusion criteria did not expect progression. And I think it's the inclusion criteria, not what happened before, which is important also to use the, um, the drug in clinical practice. And I think this is really the major difference. Of course, again, 30%, most likely 30% of the SSC population which were recruited to census did have FVC decline prior inclusion because this is what every cohort shows in observational studies that it's about 30% progressive in one year. But I think it's important for clinical practice, these inclusion criteria. Yes, but you know, the, the HR, for, for example, the HRCT pattern uh, can also play a big role in this uh, recruitment of patients because in the scleroderma study line two, there was an uh, efficacy of MMF, but, but the most, uh, let's say, so the, 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 the most uh, uh, frequent finding HRCT was ground glass opacification and not fibrotic changes. So we don't know what the patient's had in the past, for example, in the census trial, if they started with uh, the ground glass opacification and they had the progression to fibrotic, more fibrotic lesions in, in two years, for example, so all these kind of data are not there. And not only the lung function, of course, there are uh, criteria based on lung function tests and so on, but I think the history of the patient is uh, as well as important because the question we have to answer is, should antifibrotic treatment the first one or not? in these patients with uh, uh, fibrotic lesions or decline or not decline lung function tests in the past. So uh, it's a major question about sequentiality or sequential treatment or combination. Mm -hmm. But we don't have studies on this. <laughs> so this is what we, um, and also many of the questions which are coming in are really asking when to initiate what and when to add. So in there, we don't have studies. So they, we don't have randomized clinical trials who answer these important questions. Let me switch gear to the therapy now, because the first question that came from um, the Vietnam, uh, Dr. Trang Wu, um, is partic uh, particularly interesting in this. The case diagnosed with a PPFCD DILD, um, they have not been treated optimal before. If you treat them with immunosuppressant first, then add antifibrillator later, or both of those at once. So the, the same questions, is it sequential or is it um, a combination at the first time if they are not treated um, optimal before? Anna, what's your... So for me, you know, for the rheumatology patients are mostly not only treated for the lung. So most, these are multi-organ diseases. So many of the patients receive their immunosuppression also because they have other organs involved. So um, <clears throat> this is, we cannot stop to treat the other organs just to treat the lung. So this is uh, one thing. So we need to um, understand first, why does the patient get immunosuppressive? Is it purely for the lung or is it also for other organs? If it's for other organs, I never stop the immunosuppressives. I would add nintedanib in these patients. And again, we don't have studies on this, but we have hints from both inbuilt and hints from census that it's safe. And it also even in census looked efficacious Again, not powered, but we have a hint. So I would add nintedanib. And um, actually also in most patients with uh, where we only purely treat the lung, I also mostly add nintedanib. I've had some patients where I um, stopped immunosuppressive treatment, but these were then other reasons and that they had more infections or whatever. But if it's really uh, due to pure um, treatment failure, I would add nintedanib. But again, important to understand this is my port combination or um, a sequential treatment. Okay. So um, another specific question to all the three um, experts here, given the fact that nintedanib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, would you be concerned about hepatitis B reactivation if used in patients who has uh, hepatitis B core antibody positive but hepatitis surface antigen negative? Is tenor for where necessary? This is a um, question in terms of reactivation 
of hepatitis B. Any experience? Nicole, Francesco? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't screen patients for hepatitis B before I start an internship. So I don't know the answer. And, you know, I think I think that's a very, very relevant question in some parts of the world. Um, maybe it depends on, you know, where you are in part of the world, but I, I confess I don't know the answer and I don't screen for them personally. And I haven't had anyone come back with formin and hepatitis before. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, I, I guess, you know, obviously it's very important to do uh, liver function tests at baseline uh, and obviously, you know, monthly for the first three months and three monthly afterwards. So I think, you know, screening at baseline, if someone has deranged liver function test, then you would, you know, reconsider your stance. Uh, and, and I would then, you know, at least do some baseline ultrasound and do a, a hepatitis screen. Uh, and, and obviously if it's positive, then I would refer to our gastroenterologist. So I would screen for baseline liver function, but I would not screen for hepatitis, strictly speaking. So I don't know what other people do. Any differences, Professor Anna or Francisco? Me neither, no. But, but I know from colleagues, from Italy, because in Italy is quite endemic hepatitis B. They, they screen for hepatitis before starting Italy, but in Germany, north of Germany, okay. we don't do that. So another specific question to Professor Anna: um, What is your experience using Nintendo in um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis and other CTD ILD um, other than SSC ILD? How I can only I can only answer for the other CTD ILDs because I don't treat HP. Right. Um, so. Um, we actually also, as, uh, as Nicole already said, in Australia, we also need to um, wait for progression, actually, for the other CTD ILDs, because this is what was shown of where the inclusion criteria for inbuilt. So this is why, in my opinion, it's very important to stress the differences, because here we also needed to see that these patients were progressive on standard of care treatment before we are allowed to, um, to, to add Nintedanib. So here, of course, but I think what is important and still kind of misunderstood in many centers is these patients don't need to be progressive for two years. They need to show progression within two years. So it's enough if you have a patient on MMF, if you have a patient on whatever treatment for, for ILD, and they show a progression within three months, we can still add Nintedanib. So um, we have uh, quite a lot of patients now with uh, CTD ILDs as well, other than SSC, where we add Nintedanib. Um, or we will start in it. And if once they're progress, progressive on standard of care treatment. Hmm. Well, Francesco, how about um, HP? What is your um, answer to that? When would you start um, internet in this uh, HP population? Uh, yes, of course, um, <laughs> difficult question because it's also a disease with multi, multiple path, uh, pathways, immunological pathways and then fibrotic pathways and also a very heterogeneous HRCT presentation. So <clears throat> generally we start with antigen avoidance and then uh, we add up uh, prednisolone and we tend now, based on the available evidence, we tend to use MMF. And then if we have so over six months, uh, two to three follow-up points, and then we add Nintendonib if there is progression of fibrotic lesions and so on. But we tend to be quite careful and to be sure that the patients, uh, for example, didn't miss the antigen avoidance. Yeah? because this is the principal uh, motor <laughs> of the disease. So, and then... Sometimes, but I, I don't know if our data can be extrapolated, we uh, repeat the BAL, the bronchovalvular lavage, and we look at lymphocytosis in the BAL. If it's very high, we tend to, uh, yes, uh, we tend to yeah, let, it, so we, we, we want to, uh, to, to do a combination treatment, so by adding intensive on top of MMF and prednisolone sometimes, yeah. Anything additional to add, um, Nico? Sorry. Yeah, I agree with everything that Francesco said. I think that the answer, it's, there's no one answer fits all, but even within my hospital, there are people that, that would go to intend it first and there were people that would use immunosuppressive first. And I tend to be in the latter camp. So I, I think it's still a disease where inflammation is the inciting agent. And I think, you know, it should be treated with anti-inflammatory first. I think it's hard when, if your CT looks purely fibrotic, if you're actually sure in your heart that 
all those are, there's no ground glass and, and even the ground glass is not fine reticulation or fibrosis. And that's very hard to say. And I think this is where AI comes in. If we have an AI model that says this is only inflammation, this is only fibrosis, then it's easy. And until it becomes available, I think it's still default to immunosuppressive therapy. Now, having said that, if it's clearly fibrotic, I would give them a month of steroids and they don't, if they don't um, respond, then I would table them really quickly and switch to nintendinate. So I think it's Courses for courses and response to treatment as well. Good. Now, um, this but very... avoidance of therapy, avoidance of antigens is, is 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 the most important thing. But the people that do the worst are the ones that there's no antigen identified, so they behave just like IPF. Yes. So your yeah, um, probably Professor Anna, um, the experience with nintendinib. How long does nintendinib take to start to have a clear effect in uh, in clinical practice that the patients can feel? This one question. So based on your experience. <laughs> and uh, well, very difficult question, actually. And I think what we need to, again, do look back to the trials. And when we look in the census trial, um, the patients did not have any change in patient reported outcomes. So in an SSE patients, um, we would actually also not really expect that the patient over a one-year treatment will feel the difference, right? And um, in inbuilt, the LPF actually, so the living with pulmonary fibrosis was the used patient reported outcome measure, and it showed a significant difference. So, but in my experience, I usually tell my patients that they should not expect to feel a huge difference. And um, in my clinical practice, the treatment goal is slowing FVC decline. So it's not like an improvement or an improvement in, um, in, pay, in, 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 in symptoms. Um, so I, I would be very careful to say that we can expect a, a patient reported or a patient uh, well-being or uh, whatever uh, within a certain time frame. Um, however, this is, of course, what we want. I mean, we, we would like to that the patients feel better and have a better um, capacity. But this is not my experience that we feel much. But at least I think what is important, and this is maybe also the main question, is really that we should have defined treatment goals because these are expensive treatments. Um, some of the immunosuppressive treatment have a lot of side effects with infections, whatever. So I think it is important to have clear treatment goals. So if it, the treatment goal is to slow decline of FVC, then we should start uh, note this and then follow the, the patients up. And if we think we would have a treatment where, where we can expect a patient improvement also in respiratory symptoms, then we should have this as a treatment goal. However, in my patients, I, I don't do this. I, I don't know what Nicole and Francesco do, but I'm not expecting that the patients get much better in their respiratory symptoms. Go, well, Francesco. What's your... yeah, go ahead, Nicole. Well, you know, as Anna and, and Francesco will say, we know that it only slows disease progression down. Uh, in this cohort of patients. But I think you can say that in terms of, again, I think ma managing expectations or treatment goals is really important because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have people that go to a GP and then GP says, oh, you're having diarrhea, let's just stop it because it's not really working. You know, you and you have to educate not just the patients, but the general practitioners as to the aim of treatment is to slow disease progression, not to improve symptoms. And side effects are manageable. You know, that you can dose titrate, you know, have drug holidays, you know, take lomotil gastro stop. So I think it's it's a matter of educating the 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 general practitioner as well as the patient. Um, but you can say that in the in the impulses trials and the input trials, there is signal at three months. You know that 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 appears to be a separation as early as three months. And so I tend to then they say, oh, can I do a lung function next week? It's like no, because it's not going to show anything. So I would say, you know, the aim is to slow disease progression. Would expect maybe signal with three months and therefore I'll do a lung function, you know, in, in four months time, so to speak. So I think a lot of it's really, you know, expectation of, 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 of side effects and also, um, you know, what are we trying to do in terms of slowing disease progression versus reversibility? Anything to add, Francesco? No, probably. So I can only echo what uh, Anna and Nicole have said, but uh, probably we need also better patients reported outcomes based on, also on uh, daily activities and not only symptoms, just to, to, to better characterize if there are symptom variations, even in a shorter period of time, probably three months, six months uh, is uh, utopia. 
but uh, probably over two years or one year and a half uh, could be possible to, to catch some differences also in terms of symptoms, yeah? stabilization versus worsening and so on. So the data from in inbuilt on, I guess, or other uh, longer rollover, rollover studies are very important in this sense. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'll just give two more questions. Um, in patients, with Nintendo on follow up with one week of increased shortness of breath, no infection identified. In your practice, percentage of these patients who may have pulmonary embolism in the light of the reported probe uh, thrombotic effect of Nintendo. Uh, Dr. Ruth Dilena Gracia. Any takers? Francesco, you can go first this time. <laughs> but can, can you? Can you... <laughs> So I'm trying to find the question. In the last chat. one. Last one. <laughs> last one. <laughs> last second one. Yeah. A patient in a one week uh, increased shortness of breath on intendinib, no infections identified. What are the percentage of patients who have pulmonary embolism in light of the reported prothrombic effect of intendinib? So in my experience, only only few patients. I can I, I don't have any percentage in the hand, but. I think uh, we can always perform a diagnostics to exclude lung embolism or su subsegmental lung embolism. That, that's not a problem, but I think there are only a few patients uh, also during the trial. So I remember the, the impulsis trials, for example, or even the tomorrow trials, there were only a few patients with a deep vein thrombosis and lung embolism. I, I think the, the initial issue uh, or warning about the thromboembolic um, risk under Nintendinib has been uh, reduced over time. I don't know it, what Nicole thinks, but I think um, we see only a few patients. And I, I, don't, I, I don't know if this is really dependent on Nintendinib <laughs> or mm. the, the risk itself in, in IPF, for example. Any experience? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I think my experience is it's very, very low. Uh, I think it's not ju just thrombosis, also obviously increased bleeding risk. And this is why in the impulses trials, there, they were people who were on anticoagulation, uh, you know, warfarin or NOAX and were actively excluded. But I see that with the inbuilt trial, you know, there's not such a not such a warning with the inbuilt trial. So perhaps, you know, with with the hindsight of real life data and post analysis that now we are beginning to use it with combination, but albeit cautiously as well. Um, but in, in my clinical practice, I really haven't seen any more with thrombosis on Nintendo Nip. Um, we're obviously seeing quite a lot now with post-COVID, um, you know, be people with post-COVID getting KE and they happen to be on Nintendo Nip. So I would ascribe it more to COVID post-COVID than to Nintendo Nip itself if they're, you know, they're on if they've had COVID with Nintendo Nip. So I think it's a theoretical risk, but I think the risk is very low and I don't think we can quantify it. Last answer, Professor Anna, anything to add? In terms of that? No, no. Think okay. to okay. I don't I, have, I haven't experienced it. Yeah. I just have one very last question, very pressing one. Um, for early um, treatment response with um, with intent, uh, with the antifibrotic, which FBC do we use? Because I see Professor Nicole did use 80% uh, or uh, less than 80, and because there are two, and some of them uses more than 90. So should we use 80% or 90%? in order to have a response early treatment? What is your thought? Because there are, there are two uh, studies. Yeah, I don't think it's a threshold thing. I think that the, 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 the answer is as early as possible. Um, I can't remember one of those trials had, yeah, like the, you know, there were there was a ceiling, ceiling um, in one of the criteria, but I think in my clinical practice, it's as early as possible. So from with lung function, there is a wide range of normality. Right. So we say that between 80 and 120 is normal, but we have people that are super normal. They were 150, 160. You know, how do you account for that? So, you know, no one has lung function when they're normal. They only have lung function when they're abnormal. So maybe we should have spirometry the day for everybody the whole world round. And this is the problem. You don't know where you come from. So I think you've got if you've got symptoms and you're uh, and, and you've got disease on CT, uh, I don't care what the lung function is in terms of our IPF. Um, obviously, PPF, you need to wait for progression. And I've had, you know, more 
So I, you know, unfortunately, I appeared was very, you know, the diagnosis is very late. So the average time for presentation to diagnosis is about two, two years. So there's a very, you know, there's a big delay. And so a lot of people would have come to us with moderate, you know, if not severe disease. But I think with the advent of, um, you know, screening for lung cancer, you know, screening for coronary angiogram. So the last question, in fact, I had a patient last week that came in, basically had a strong term history of ischemic heart disease, had a CT coronary angiogram, and then had these CT changes. And his FEC was 93% and his DRC was 85%. Uh, and we had discussions about, you know, blah, blah, but at the end, we just treated it. Um, so, yes, I don't think the cutoffs are but important for me. I think it's really based on, yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and don't thanks. forget that uh, FEC is not a reliable marker in patients with emphysema and combined pulmonary emphysema and fibrosis. So, uh, I think you have to look <laughs> in another direction to other parameters for that patients. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, um, Professor Anna, Professor Nico, and Professor Francesco for your time. And I think we all got smarter in terms of understanding how we manage ILD, myself included. So um, we're going to launch an um, uh, uh, evaluation online. So just fill it up for the participants. And that leaves me... Thank you very much for your Saturday, very early in the morning for the European. Thank you so much. I look forward for um, the meeting you in person in ERS or anything. And hopefully we can come to uh, more face-to-face -face after this COVID session as well. And have a good evening, Professor Nicole. And um, for the rest of the participants, thank you for your time. It is very much appreciated. And I'm sure they learn a lot with this kind of discussion. And thank you again. Have a great day ahead. Thank, thank you. you so much for the invitation. Bye, yeah. everyone. Thank you, CS. Bye, Francesco. Bye. Bye, Anna. Bye, bye Nicola. Bye, bye. Bye, bye Nicola, Francesco, and Jen. Are we leaving officially, CS? Yes, we can. Thank you. You want us to have a feedback session? OK. Have a good day. All right. Thanks a lot. How you mean? Recording stopped.